All right, Hoban, you ready for some Truck Show podcast action? Yeah, this is the uh, official SEMA edition. All and right. We're live in the EGR booth here in the lovely West Hall. All right, let's hit it. The Truck Show podcast, live from the SEMA show in Las Vegas. Presented by Nissan. With support from EGR, Banks, and Amsoil. So the amazing thing about this is we did this last year and they invited us back. Yeah, apparently we weren't that bad. <laughs> or we were really cheap. <laughs> One of the two. It is happy hour in the EGR booth over here. So if you are thirsty and you need a brew, like our man Bernard Leitner over here, grabbing some beer, ice cold, it's on the house. Come on Thanks down. Thanks to EGR. All right, do you want to officially start the show now? That wasn't official? No, this is. Okay. The Truck Show. We're going to show you what we know. We have the lowered and everything in between. We'll talk about trucks that run on diesel and the ones that run on gasoline. The truck, truck show, sing it. The truck show, the truck show. Whoa, oh, come on. It's the truck show with your hosts, Lightning. And Holman. Hey, that's us. What are you, too cool for school? You yes. can't sing it like you normally do in the yep. studio? Somebody uh, was in the elevator the other day, and they're like, oh, dude, this is my first SEMA. This is so awesome. And I'm like, wow, I remember my first SEMA. And he's like, how many years ago is that? I'm like, 23. <laughs> You've done this for 23 years? Yeah, this is my 23rd SEMA, and that I would be 24, but we had that uh, COVID year off, so... Yeah. Yeah. I was I coming here the, that the first couple years. I was like super into Hondas, you know, yeah. lowered Hondas. Yeah, one of this, yeah, this is pre uh, uh, Fast and the Furious. Okay. And uh, yeah, I would salivate all over those that, that scene. Yeah. And then I, I grew up and I became a truck guy. You know, what's funny is uh, I look at all my friends and I feel like, uh, you know, I'm still 25 year old, you know, walking around the show and we all look really old now. A little bit. You look <laughs> older because you've got a lot more gray than I, I do. I do have a lot of gray. Yeah. I, I had one of those uh, those memories in my phone came up where uh, Apple decides to like regale you with a photo of X amount of years ago. And it was like five, and it was dark brown. And I remember when we started this, sh- this podcast, I had almost no gray. Look what you've done to me. It's weird. I've watched you age. <laughs> yeah, right there's there's, there's definitely been accelerated <laughs> aging during the uh, the course of this. What is this? Almost seven years now. Has this show put any uh, any years on you? I can tell you that this show is longer than my first marriage. So, uh, <laughs> you know, one of my longest partnerships. <laughs> so we've got uh, we, we've got a little audience out here. What's going on, guys? Come on now. Woo, what's a? Hey, oh, jeez, <laughs> they're tired. It's been a long day. Oh, look at these guys over here. Right? What's up, <laughs> Marco? Uh, it's more people that uh, that Holman knows. You yeah. get stopped every thirty seconds in the hall. Like you it's, were on your way to the restroom, and guys like, "What's up, Holman? What's yeah, going on?" No, it's, it's weird because I'll walk around with some of my like actual friends that are famous, mm-hmm. and like I would never want that because like they can't move at all, and I'm mostly anonymous except for like if you know, you know. And I'm like, it's like, oh, and, you know, walk a few minutes. Uh, this hall for sure. It does say Holman on your shirt, by I the way. I can walk around uh, Central Hall, no problem. Nobody cares. Which is great. Oh, because it's all hot rods and whatnot. It's all hot rods. You yeah. walk in here and you're like a rock star. I don't know about that, but... I mean, a little you know. bit. Okay. A little right. bit. We appreciate yeah, that. The West Hall. Yeah. So, of course, we are in the EGR booth, and yep. we've got our friends from EGR. And as you guys know, on the TRX, I'm rocking a roll track. Awesome. And uh, we're awesome surrounded. We've got, we've got a, uh, a grenadine, as I like to call it back no, here. That's no, that's quartermaster. That, that's, that's the drink that my kids no, had, right? No, no, no. Oh, the grenadier, grenadier is the SUV. That's the quartermaster. Right? Okay, that's got right. it. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, where's our man? Where, where's Bernard at? Where, where's Bernard? Where's Bernard, Bernard Leitner? Bernard hey. walked through. Come oh, on there, over oh, here. There he is. He has a beer in his hand. That's what it is. Oh. Come on. Come on, Bernard. Let's, let's talk about this uh, awesome quartermaster. Yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah, all right. That's your mic. You can pull the chair out. Yeah, we're going to do this. Are your mountains blue on that there? Tell me if I got your headphones up. Is that it? Bernard, what's going on? You uh, you had a hand in this build over here. Uh, a small hand, yeah. Actually, Sarah from LGE CTS Motorsports built this, but uh, she called us up and wanted uh, a roof rack for it. And uh, so we did set that up. Yeah, a roof rack, and then obviously our, our gear pod roofs, which open from the side. So we're the only one who does that. Okay. I, I have that pod on, uh, on my Wrangler, and I love that thing. That box is great because it opens from the side completely transforms the way you use boxes on overlanding rigs it's it's when you okay so people don't know this i don't know i don't think they know this but you called me up and you said hey come down to the shop i want to and, and one of my very first clients after i uh, left my previous employment and started my own company 
And uh, this man right here called me up and said, I got something for you. So I went down and he showed me this. And I'm like, how has nobody ever thought about taking the box and opening it from the side. Did he say, I've got a lot of accoutrement for you? The accoutrement that you will need. Accoutrement! Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> now, uh, what is special about your rack? Because we talked about this before on the... Are on you going to... Re- publicly, you're going to ask him what's special about his rack? Yes. So on the Ineos, <laughs> uh, you went through a bunch of variations, and you kind of had to f- figure out some things. And I think you have one of the best setups that are out there. Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, I mean, we're uh, just looking at the con- customer base. I've been on a bunch of Ineos Grenadier runs, and it, it'll be like half of the people on the run will have a Lightner rack, and the other ones won't have any rack. So our market penetration is really good on it. And uh, I think what we did different on that. How does it feel to be the Grenadier guy? I, you know, I, I th- <laughs> it's feeling better every day. Okay. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was one of the first people to get one. Yeah. I went right to the day it came out, I got one. So um, I remember I, you let me drive it. Yeah, well, the first one. The first one. Yeah. Just, <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lightner actually owns two now. Yeah. So, so yeah, we actually own uh, two. What's the one that's parked outside? That's the first one. That's the first one. That's the first one. That's got. way different than when I drove it. That's all done up and lifted and yeah. wheels, tires now. So. That one has the new Fox two and a half inch lift okay. on it and right. uh, 34 inch uh, mud terrains from Firestone. So I've got to come back out to the shop and put some miles on that thing. You, yeah, absolutely. All right. It's getting loaned out. It's right. getting loaned out to all sorts of people. Anyone can actually pretty much drive it. Awesome. Pretty Including, much anyone. Inclu- oh, I knew pretty it. Much pretty much anyone. It was a side eye. Yeah. Did yeah. you see that? Lightning, you're excluded from that right now. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, no, no. now, he's probably better on vehicles than you are. Yeah, I, I hear I'm rough. <laughs> everyone, you know, everyone that that works for me, all my employees, they're all like, oh, geez. Bernard's Listen, when you go off-roading run. and the wheel pulls off in your hand, I mean, that's pretty. And, and <laughs> it's that's happened twice on two different vehicles. Yeah. The steering wheel has come off twice At some on your point, vehicles. That's a you issue. Yeah, I think I'm a, I'm very firm on that steering wheel <laughs> when I grip it. I am not strong. Uh, you hands. need an O S H, you know, handle of some sort. I, it's not a steering I, wheel. I might be a better passenger. <laughs> so. Yeah. I have a feeling you'd be an awful passenger. Yeah. You need to be in control. Yeah, I think you need to be driving. Nah, yeah. if I got a beer in me, I'm pretty good. Okay. No, all right. All right. Noted. I loosen up Noted. pretty quick. <laughs> How has it been uh, working with the EGR crew? Oh, it's been great. Yeah. We've been working with them for quite a while. They make, and I can honestly say this because there are a lot of tonneau covers out there, right? There are so many, and we make a tonneau truck bed rack, right? We, yes, do, we do make a tonneau truck bed rack, and we make it fit many different applications. But the only one that actually can survive our testing where the steering wheels rip off is an EGR one. The EGR one is actually bolted into the side of the truck bed. Like everything else is held on with an aluminum clamp, like a little clamp, and there's two of them. And every and the EGR ones are all bolted in. My buddy has one on a TRX we did testing on. For a heavy rack with a rooftop tent, that thing won't go anywhere. And the beauty is you can have basically a weatherproof trunk or you can have an open pickup bed. Yep. You can take your rack, you can slide your bar forward, you can put a motorcycle in the back. So it's very modular in the configuration when you pair those two products together. Have yeah. you ever measured, because um, you're a data-driven guy, have you ever measured the force that it, you know, if uh, when you land on, off a jump or something, I mean, how when many pounds? When you hug your TRX eight feet in the air and come down nose first, what does that do to your rack? That's what he's asking. I mean, as far as data, like data acquisition, we haven't actually done that on that, but I have nosed other competitors, uh, Tano's and it has ejected over the top of the TRX. Oh. And I had my secretary in the seat when I did it in at, at uh, King of the Hammers. And she still talks about that every day. We nosed it into a whoop at way too high of a speed. <laughs> and the whole thing ejected off the truck. It, it came completely off or did it wrap over the... It wrapped the, over the front of the, the, the cab. Oh, man. And the rear ones failed and just wrapped did over the front. Did it dent the, uh, yeah, the hood? We, oh, it, it did. We fixed it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With but an EGR roll that. track. <laughs> the, the, yeah, but Maddie, my my girl in the front office, she still talks about that. She's like, that was a rough, that was a rough day. That was yeah. a rough day. Yeah, it's not going to happen with the roll track. Yeah, no, no, it's bolted right in. No, those are solid. Okay. Awesome. So what's new for you at the show? Are you just on, on foot? Like, uh, what have you seen? The, I've seen a bunch of products, but here. I haven't seen a Lightner booth. What's that? Sorry. I've seen you on foot. Yeah, yeah, Walking yeah, around, yeah. I've seen a lot of products around, but yeah. I haven't seen a, a booth. Are you just uh, yeah. showcasing through uh, vehicles? Basically. Yeah. Exactly. That's pretty much what we do. Yeah. We we sponsor a lot of vehicles out here, put it, you know, space it evenly around the show. We love SEMA. Been going for 20 years. I saw you in the Mopar booth. Uh, in there. Uh, on and if on you the go Power to, Wagon. And if you go to the Mopar booth, yeah. they have our rack, and we are yeah. an affiliate uh, 
affiliate partner with awesome. Mopar, so they sell our product. Dude, yeah. I love when my friends get successful. You know, they uh, it's not reciprocated though. You're not successful. Just, so they don't, could you they run off on us a little bit? <laughs> I, I always enjoy this podcast. I always love talking to you guys. You guys rock. Oh, thank uh, you. I appreciate you it. You guys rock. All thank right, you. we'll take that. Do you know that you guys have shared something that I haven't? You guys have both been in Lockjaw, the bank's truck, and, oh, right. uh, and I haven't. You both have ripped around no, a block faster. That's I, not true. I have physically been in well, it. Well, you haven't driven it, but because you revved it and broke it. But I have not been over five miles an hour in it, <laughs> and you both were ripping down the street. Uh, that was pretty awesome. Yes. And you got me that ride in it. Like, yes, I know that. You like I was the first person, like, you just waved me over I and I jumped selfless. in that seat. I, I watched not, you run yeah. down the street to get I into did. the lock drop. <laughs> you, you, you jumped on the sword for me on that yeah. one. Like, just come yeah. here. I'm like, awesome. And then, and then Sean jumped in, and, uh, and then on the way back, we heard it. Oh, yeah. I no, didn't hear it. It wasn't my fault. No, it wasn't his fault at you all. You got to wear headphones. Yeah, yeah, you do have to wear headphones with that. Yeah, that it's thing. got fire engine headphones, so you can talk to each other. It's pretty oh, cool, right? It is it's super like, cool. No, right, how fast are we going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 amazing. High, high power. I don't know. How, I don't think the guy driving it knew how much horsepower torque it had. It just too much for the tires. Yeah, <laughs> that's way part too of the fun, much, right? Yeah, it's part of the fun. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for stopping by. Appreciate Thanks, it brother. as always. We thank love you. you guys. Love having uh, you. Thanks, great Lionel. job working with uh, EGR uh, on the uh, Ineos over here. So yeah. uh, look forward to what you do next with them. Appreciate. it. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Yeah. Where's Jesse Spade? There he is. Jesse just came back. Can we bring? I got all, all, yeah. all three of us. Can we do that? Yeah, let's do you it. You can gang up on the mic. We'll do our best. Yeah. yeah. You guys will have to share it, so it might be weird, but. We've shared it before. Okay, great. <laughs> it's Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here comes Mike and Dusty. Come on. All right, Mike and Dusty. We got to share the mic. Not this mic. This mic. <laughs> no, don't share Microphone. Mic. <laughs> Mike, let's be very sure. specific here. Keep it in the middle. You so, be, you're smaller. Okay. So you're to prevent feedback, mic. we do have to have you get up on the mic. This is the closest three people have ever been on the mic at the Truck Show <laughs> Podcast in our seven years. So, All right. <laughs> All right. Holman, who do we have? Oh. We've got uh, is it Jesse Spade, That's Dusty me. Pack, and Mike Bergeren. Did, did I? I'm gonna well, he, butcher you, it. You butchered it in slow motion. <laughs> How did you close do that? <laughs> Berger. What's the correct Mike pronunciation? B. It's Bergeren. Bergeren. Okay. So apparently, you guys are the trifecta of builds. Like the. Tell us how you got hooked up with EGR and what did you build in this booth? Well, we did not build anything in this booth. Oh, okay. But I've known Pat Johnson. Oh, he's uh, a good guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For years and years and years. He once so. locked lightning in a prototype Ram pickup bed with a roll track on it. That happened. Yeah. He did? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's not We're going to leave them that way. I would expect <laughs> nothing less. Yeah. That's what you, uh, yeah. I'm yeah. trappable. You know why they have those little yellow uh, glow-in-the-dark handles? Yeah. It was because of that incident. Uh, yeah. It's uh, very important. <laughs> so, no, we, uh, I, Pat, back in the day, used to work for Omics Ada, Rugged Ridge, and they helped me. They sponsored a Jeep I brought uh, back in the day to their booth, and I designed a couple uh, wheels, different wheel models for them, and I was in the Jeep business forever and ever and ever and ever, and, and uh uh, ran into Pat, said he's with EGR now. We came by and nice. love the stuff here and wanted to uh, talk to you guys. You're doing a little bit of TV too, huh? Yeah, we do. Yeah. So we're uh, with Courtney the, and with Courtney Hanson, yeah. yeah. The three of us are on uh, Ride of Your Life on Motor Trend. Yep. Yeah, so Mike uh, is our upholstery guy, Dusty's the uh, project manager on the show. Tell us about the show for those who haven't seen it. The easiest way is, you know, it's kind of similar to overhauling, um, but we don't start with their car. We, you know, find a car, totally surprise them with it. A uh, friend, loved one calls in, writes us, or uh, tells a story. It's usually somebody who had to give their car or uh, sell their car, you know, to help somebody times. out, or yeah, guys, whatever. Yeah. Their kids, a lot of single moms, veterans, you know, things like that. That uh, and they were just never able to get their car back. So we find one. These are all heartstrings. Pull on on heartstrings. All of the stories, right? It's total heartstrings. Have you Nobody ever found everyone. the actual car they had to give away? Uh, no. Oh. Well, no, that's not true. Yeah, the one time. Runner. Yeah, we did a Roadrunner, and they had a. Uh, it had kind of stayed in the family. Yeah. Sort of got lost in the mix, and uh, we got to actually get our hands on that actual That's car. That's pretty cool. 69 Roadrunner convertible. Really cool. Was the uh, recipient of that, like, blown away that that was the car? Yeah. So that was, uh, that was a big crying episode. They're always surprised. It's real tears. It's real. These people are really surprised. We do a good job of not letting them know that they're getting a car. And how much work do you have to do after the fact after you've presented the vehicle you know all the tv show car builds like you get it 70 percent there yeah. you give it to them and you go oh by the way the I cameras aren't rolling we need to get that car back so we can finish it i think you just nailed it that's probably about right 70 yeah okay. they're running driving stopping yep you know they look good on camera we get them back we have to make sure they're safe and 
everything screwed in. <laughs> so Dusty, you're the show manager, but you actually own a shop in Oklahoma? Yeah, I own a shop in Oklahoma City. Uh, six months out of the year, I'm in Atlanta working for Royal, running the shop down there, keeping things Oh, alive. you're busy. I'm busy. So. Who runs your shop when you're gone? Uh, my guy Grant is here with okay. me. He runs the shop when right I'm on. gone. His brother Caleb. They keep it rolling while I'm out of town, but we got nine employees. I've got 12,000 square feet. Wow. I've got 23 builds and project in progress What's your right wait now. list right now? My wait list? Yeah. If you finished all your projects... On time. If, if, if I was I, a new customer, how long would it take me to get mine built? I would say I wouldn't be able to touch it probably till maybe next spring right now. Okay, why is that too bad? Get, wait, wait. One slot. Spring of 25 okay. or spring of 26? 25. We're, we're, push, we're pushing through. We are right, pushing okay. through. Okay. So. You say 26, so you sound like a baller. 2028. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but no, we're, uh, we're, we're pushing out cars. Guys, now, if, guys I, if I were to bring a car to you, and uh, that 2028 number came up. Could I just give you a couple hundos and like move that up in line? Is that how you work? A couple hundred thousand hundos. <laughs> you talk, You're not uh, gonna pull a Fred Durst, Jesse James, where he tells him to kick rocks, no matter how much he's gonna throw down. No, I've turned a lot of people away. I've turned. I probably turned more work away than I've brought in. Over Was it the years. vibe of I don't want to be married to this person? A lot of it is. You yeah. have to interview your clients. You totally, especially you know? when you're doing high-end builds. Exactly, because right? yeah. you don't want to get halfway through a build. Yeah. You have a vision, they have a vision, you agree on it, then you get halfway through and they want to change something, yeah. and automatically it's my fault. Right. Everything's written like, down. No, 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 you change order. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to protect yourself. But no, it's, it's a blast, man. I've been in business for myself for 11 years last month and doing the TV show since 2020. So I'm, I'm all over in love and life. Where were awesome. you before your own shop, and how did you make that jump to entrepreneurialism? So in 90, 98, 99, a good friend of mine in Oklahoma City, uh, Jake McKitty, he owns a shop now oh, called yeah. Fat Fabs. Dude, yeah, we, we, I worship so, I worship He's Jake's a huge work. Fat Fabs. You have had no him on idea. the show before. Great J- dude. Jake and I went to school yeah, together. Yeah. Awesome dude. It was, it was Slambury 99. We both went there. Slambury. <laughs> yeah. So I started a truck and magazine in the early 2000s. So. so we saw an, uh, an S10 or Sonoma. Heat there. Wave. Uh, Can't get wrong. Heat Wave. Gre- um, I, show Fest. Show, I died at Heat Wave. <laughs> I've been there. Show Fest was terrible. Slambury. You know. LS. I mean, all so of So anyways, so. we... Um, kind of got into trucks about the same time. Nice. So he was still driving a semi for his granddad's grease company in Choctaw at the time. And over at his parents' house, we just started trying to bag his truck, figuring it out as we went. Yeah. So we got into it about the same. So he went his way, I went mine. Fast forward, I'm an aircraft mechanic by trade. I'm working on DC-9s and MD-80s. Okay. I'm building cars and trucks on the side. By the way, Mad Dog, solid plane. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying right now. Really? MD-80, Mad Dog series. Yeah. MD-80, okay. Yeah. Whatever. Bro. Anyway, dude. I'm not I'm I, an AV, I, I, I love I'm aviation. There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So, just but, give a little uh, love back to the aviation people, that's all. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, I just got tired of doing them on the side. And I sighed, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it full time. And awesome. uh, turned in my turned in my paperwork. I left a six-figure job to try to take my passion full time, and that was 11 years ago. So now I'm on television, and I'm getting way... You leaving? I love it. I, this it, is the best part about doing a live show. It, it doesn't CMO. matter. It doesn't matter. People are just cruising yeah, by. We're whatever. Waiting, right? They look at the mic, say, ignore that. Hey, whatever. what's going on? <laughs> hey, oh, beer. Hi. Yeah. I'm going to be over there. Yeah. yeah. That's the story of Dusty. Cool. Yeah. So, so, Mike, you're an upholsterer by trade. Yep. Let's turn the mic. Yep. So are you, like, more old school in pleats and things like that? Or you do anything? Or what's what's what materials? What's your vibe? Uh, well, I mean, I'm most of what I'm doing now is I, I work high-end German. Okay. Uh, let's say. Uh, yeah. I actually work for a Porsche during the day at uh, headquarters in Atlanta. Oh, wow. So that's uh, your jacket says Porsche Classic right yes. there. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm in there. So, I mean, it's all so about... So you're doing high-end. High-end, yeah. that kind of stuff. All leather Alcantara, that kind of okay. stuff. All one-off kind of. Yeah. How so. much of that is... Um, automated with laser or by just none scissor? Of none of it. Yeah, none of it. Every, everything starts with masking tape with me and builds up. So it's old school cutting, craftsmanship. You know, 100% wow. old school craftsmanship. So you work at like old hand. 911s and things like that and bringing them back up. So somebody takes you a cherished car and says, I want this rebuilt through the Porsche program. Yep. Everything from the 356 up to yeah. the 997, I believe, is the current classic. I, uh, I have to admit to uh, hurting a 356 one time. So I will always wear that pain on my heart did it cost you personally uh no because my uh my boss who's the shop owner handled it and the customer it was a uh a 356b coupe and i was pulling it out of the shop and i was like 18 or 19 and i I drove all those high-end cars forever i worked at a mercedes bmw porsche shop turbos slant noses m3s you know e34s all that stuff um e39 m5s all that 
no problem. For whatever reason, this I thought I had it in reverse, and because the shifter was so loose, let the clutch out, popped into the back wall and the uh, into the Ouch. jacks, and it was uh, on call for a movie. Oh, and it no. bent the bodywork below the rear bumper and, and all that, and I was like, yeah, I thought I was going to get fired. And it turns out the guy who owned it was like, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get it fixed. It's, it's just a car. He, like, felt so bad for me because I was like, I'm like, classic Porsche, and I go and destroy it back of it and he's like no, no well, it's good we'll fix it got it fixed handled it most of them understand that the car is made to be driven and if yeah. you're out there driving it things happen yeah but this is a really clean car but he, he was never afraid to drive it so yeah. it works that way but yeah i mean my my background and everything is domestic street rods hot rods that mm-hmm. kind of stuff so i got pulled into the show at the end of the first season just to be kind of on set helping out yeah. a little bit and then you got pulled more into the show then i got pulled in <laughs> a lot more just before the second season began and was with them the whole time so yeah what, what's it like it took me to do two cars at my regular job we did 10 full vehicles what's so. it like to transition from your own shop your own clients a corporate job and then now tv show which is completely different from every other experience you could ever have in this world it's yeah it's completely worlds apart <laughs> but it's it's a lot of fun i mean it's kind of one of those like I, I have always said like i don't mind flying by the seat of my pants but I'm flying by the seat of everybody else's pants, yeah. especially our designer. I mean, the guy who's running the show is super creative, everything like that. But but now you got to take com- that drawing into reality. Oh, it's not even always a drawing. A lot of the time, it's just he comes up to you and goes, hey, what about this? <laughs> and he meant it, but he never said it again. Mm. And then he asked you where it was, so you got to do it at the last <laughs> second. And it's like, all right, yeah. like, let's run. How yeah. often are you impressed, like walking around SEMA, how often do you look inside of a build and go, Wow, I don't even know how they did this. Or, or, or do you walk around conversely and say, "This is not good." No, well, I mean, there's layers to everything. You can definitely tell, and I mean, I know just from being in the industry as long as I have that some and doing things myself. I mean, we had two vehicles here at the Blueprint booth outside, so some things you got to do quickly. At that point, I mean, you got to worry about like eh, it's more about the overall look and everything, and you kind of miss the minor details, but. People that do these and really build and take their time and everything, I mean, you'll see some of the best work ever here. I mean, I've kind of been in awe of this show. We just uh, awarded, I did some stuff with TMI and judging for interiors and Sean Smith uh, on the uh, the Ring Brothers K5, like that thing was like unbelievable, right? And there's a, a few of that level here at the show, but what I love about the TMI awards is you seem as always about the outside or the engine, and a lot of times the interior doesn't get done, right? So you get tinted windows. And I love how it kind of turns the cars inside out, puts the focus back on the interior. And I'm sure you probably appreciate that, too, because that's your craft. And right. it seems like that's probably the last thing to be appreciated in most cars, unless it's a convertible or something like that. It's part of the overall design theme is the interior. Uh, luckily, there's there's a couple of shops that, that I really look up to and everything that have kind of turned everything on their heads over the last couple of years. And, uh, really incorporating a lot more of the 3D modeling, 3D yep. printing, and, and really coming and full engineering and doing that, yeah. Uh, I mean, they got, like, DJ Designs avant-garde, like, their next level with it, I mean. So, them I really look up to, and I, I really give them a lot of credit for bringing that back and bringing a lot of that style out of just the audio world and really bringing it, it into the overall we've talked about that before. rod and street rod experience. Yeah. It was ex- it, I feel like it, for so long it was exclusive to the 12-volt world. Yeah, world, right? I think it started with, you know, subwoofer boxes and consoles, right, before it went door to door panels, panels and dashes yeah, and things like door, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, now with the, with the amount of additive manufacturing that's actually available on the smaller shop level, the consumer level and everything, it's really bringing that out into the forefront, a lot of what we're able to do. And there's shops that just excel. You're talking about additives to like 3D printing. It th- it, yeah, 3D printing, resin printing. I mean, even getting down into the uh, like the CNC metal shaping and that kind of stuff. But it's all getting onto the digital. Like the digital is where it's moving to. So everything's really CNC based. And now you can print full door panels. You can print full dashboards in components modularly that'll fit into factory brackets and everything like that just so it, it takes the availability of what we can do to another level just how creative are you really mm-hmm. you'll you'll find out yeah. and now we actually get to incorporate a lot of people that are video game artists and that type of stuff into it because now people are using like fusion 360 i know people that design with unreal engine and everything oh that's interesting that, that that's kind of jumped into this right. area so it's coming into that yeah. and then you can incorporate that and make the shift from cad to the cam side of it and everything mm-hmm. and it just yeah, it it's wild how technology yeah, is yeah. transformed. Even even for a guy like you that's doing old school 
you can still appreciate or even use some of that technology to help build out what you're trying to do. I mean, that's always what I'm trying to do. I always like to kind of, I, I like to pay homage to the heritage of whatever I'm working on and everything, but especially with what we're doing now where I'm at, these people are spending an exorbitant amount of money to do yeah. a full restoration and everything. I want to make sure they have to do it once. What time? Right. So build it in from the bones up, build it right, and make sure they, and then they never have to do it again. If, they, if it's going to be done again, it's because somebody wants to. Yeah. But I don't want them to ever have to. Awesome. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate Jesse, your time. Absolutely. Dusty, Mike, yeah. thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, Peter Trady's here. Come on over let's, here, Peter. Let's get Peter on the mic. Come on, and grab this mic. Come in. What's going on, Mr. I Peter Tridy? From loosely. Well, you yeah. should. You know yeah. us well enough. That's right. So I, I want to say Peter Tridy from SEMA, but yeah. he's not so or much SEMA anymore. Well, or, yeah. I mean, I mean but we now, could go through his resume. Now but we you're don't with have a company to. called ACS, which that few correct. people have heard of, but it's a very busy company, and you're probably busier now than you've ever been. I, I, yeah, I'm pretty busy these days. Uh, Automotive Consulting Services is the what the acronym stands for, and. Uh, uh, basically, doing a lot of the same work that I've been doing. That working with Rob? Yeah, we're, yep. working with Rob Simons. Yep. Um, and Stephen Ruiz and a bunch of other great, guys. Great team uh, down it's, there. It's a really great team. Um, I'm, I'm really blessed to be able to, to do this. I, I get a little more freedom in my day. And uh, I'm, I, I kind of am returning to some hands on work, which I really like. I'm hands on with the testing, I'm looking at data, I'm analyzing it, I'm you, doing the data acquisition. We should, we should give some backstory. So, you yeah. were um, the emissions compliance officer? I was, uh, my title was Director of Emissions Compliance at SEMA. Uh, that role is now filled by a, f a good friend of mine. His name is Dean Schlingman. Uh, Dean's an off-road Dean? racer. You yeah. know Dean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's uh, been uh, with uh, an OEM for quite, quite a number of years, uh, Kia, Hyundai has worked in the emissions space, so he really understands uh, that that world. He's The the aftermarket side of it is he's growing on him. You yeah, know, he's sure. Learning, learning some new stuff, but uh, he's he's really filling that role well. And um, Will you still be our go-to emissions expert? I, I'm happy to do that, All guys. Right. You, you know, I, Nobody I like, knows I, I like Harm and, and, and the devil that is the EPA <laughs> like this man right here. <laughs> Intimately. It's, it's, it's been my, uh, you know... He has danced you know, with the devil well, one too many but times. He doesn't call them the devil. He calls them the, his frenemy. <laughs> frenemy? Exactly. So, you got to get along with them. So with at ACS, though, you don't just do it. You do emissions, right? But yep. ACS is more than that. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So ACS is basically an engineering house yep. and a freelance engineering house. And we're doing um, everything from emissions compliance to design work. We've got engine modeling software that, you know, where we can really tell you exactly what you can anticipate from, from particular designs. Uh, we you also do some work. white label calibration for yep. other companies. Companies, yep, and absolutely. you have a, quite a client base who might make a hard part, yep. and then you take that hard part and you make sure that it all runs together. And exactly. then your basically your tune, your software, or your uh, integration software goes back with that manufacturer to sell with their hard part. Yeah, and a lot of the expertise that we have, we, we understand emissions. So that when you're dealing with com with uh, calibration. To, to be able to know how to calibrate to meet emissions is a, is a big piece of that. And that brings a lot of value to a lot of people. So, so I, I know from you know your previous experience, you know how to build clean burning or a compliant, I guess we could say, aftermarket products that would get approved through government regulatory bodies. You go to SEMA and you're, you're basically testing people's products and, and making sure that they pass. I'm kind of curious, have you ever gone into some of the aftermarket uh, some of the top tuners and looked at how they do their tables and do you ever look at that and go oh I see what they did here or oh that's not going to work or or have you seen any tricks of the trade things that have educated you by picking up on what some of these other folks are out there doing to kind of I guess I guess to educate yourself on yeah. how the game's being played on the other side of the fence. Yeah, there's no doubt that there are um, the things that you can you can learn as you go through this process and and areas of, of calibration. Calibration is divided up into tables. So you have these, you know, these X and Y axes and, and you have all these values And in people there. usually see like a, a, a blue, red, orange, yeah. whatever, green color chart that looks like a wave over a table. It's kind of what most people see a fuel table. And, and how do you shape that, yeah. right? When, when you're viewing it like in a 3D model, mm -hmm. right? How do you shape that? You know, where are the mountains and the valleys and all that to, to be able to make sure that the vehicle will remain compliant and still get you the power and performance that you're, that you're after with that at with that aftermarket product. So yeah, there's definitely things that you learn as you go through this and, and techniques that are, um, th that are gained through that. What's really interesting to me is the different approaches that each OEM takes. You know, the OEMs don't all do it the same. They have some of their own 
uh, uh, designs and intentions. And sometimes they're using different sensor suites. So, uh, you know, how, how you map things. And sometimes it, they're not even se- real sensors. Well, they're calculations. They're virtual. Yeah, yeah, yeah virtual exactly. sensors. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. If, if I had, let's say, manufacturer Y, and I had a, f- a dual overhead cam four-cylinder, and it's a two-liter, and I have manufacturer B, or X or whatever, and it's the same thing. It's a two-liter dual overhead cam. Is it over B cam. or is it X? Well, it doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> I have one and I have another. Can you take that table and overlay it on either of those engines because they're so similar, or would each of those, because of little quirks in design, have to be custom tuned specifically for that application? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a calibrator myself. Mm-hmm. I get to observe this a little bit over yeah. the shoulders of the other sure. guys, but every calibration is going to have certain quirks about it. There, there's always going to be limits that you have to work within. Most of those limits are going to come from the OBD system because the OBD system has has constraints. So you if you take a sensor outside of its intended range, that's going to start throwing errors and things like that. So there, you're usually working within a narrow channel somewhere. But oftentimes, like when you go to forced induction, for example, you you need to rescale the whole thing, and you know you're, now your your um, mass airflow or your uh, your pressure scales are all going to be different. So everything gets shifted, and you have to accommodate that not just in one table, but throughout the entire uh, calibration, You know, the, every table that's in there. And we're talking generally hundreds of tables. Now, now the technology has gotten to where things are more virtual. I feel like this is going to end up AI will solve this. It's, yeah, right? there's, gonna, there's definitely going to be some uh, uh, capabilities there. Now, uh, the other thing is cracking the ECU, just getting inside the ECU to even see well, these Well, some tables. of the manufacturers, I mean, the catchphrase is typically like Pentagon level encryption, right? There's some yeah. manufacturers that have their ECUs locked down and there was Toyota for longest time on the last generation trucks could not be cracked. And people right. were doing inline tuners and things like that. Well, if you think about it, like as we move into more and more ADOS control, where you have these advanced driver assistance systems. They don't want you getting in. They don't want you in there yeah. because, right. you know, it, it, look, it, it, somebody, something happens, the, the vehicle goes dead in the middle of the road, you wind up with an accident. I mean, they don't want, the, the OEMs don't want that liability. Yeah. So, yeah, they're locking it down pretty tight. And that carries over into everything. The, mm-hmm. I mean, the vehicle is one big piece of electronics now. So I kind of feel like that's one of the reasons, like, uh, companies like Ford, for example, now for the, the Ranger Raptor, Bronco Raptor, they're doing their own in-house tune for 700 and something bucks, fully warrantied, yep. 49 state legal or, or whatever it happens to be. And they're saying, listen, here's an approved calibration. It gives you a whole lot more power and we're thumbs up. Yep. It's kind of closing out the aftermarket, but at the same time, if you go to that OE, they feel better because they can give the customer something they want, but then they can ensure that they're not going to take on any more liability for yep. it. Yeah, and there's a place for that, and there are definitely customers for that. Sure. There's always going to be customers that want more. Yeah. Yep. That want it. They, they want. They want their fingers in the pie. You know, they want to be saying, I, "Yeah, I, I had uh, the the guy down the road do this this tune for me." Yeah. You know. So yeah, there's always going to be some of that, and there's personalization. There's what's under the hood. How does it look under the hood? The the, the supercharger, the their intake kit. You know, whatever it happens to be. There's a lot of visual stuff that goes along with uh, with modification too. So. I feel like we have to have a whole nother episode just with Peter. Good thing we have his phone number. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you do need, yeah, we, we but not his new email. Oh, maybe he changed I do. both. No, no, okay, I have good. it. I got uh, it. I got it. Exactly. <laughs> hey, uh, I got a question for you, Holman. Yes. So uh, you visited the Bronco Barn. Tell me about oh, it. Oh, my God. The Bronco Barn Steve's a good awesome. friend of mine. I love we, Steve. I, I, uh, I've raced with Steve for years. Yeah. And, uh, so what was it like? He, he's a good dude. So uh, he hit me up because uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell anybody this, but because <clears throat> he's a hardcore Ford guy, Ford racer. I think he has what? seven class championships and like 30 overall win- I mean just like legendary Baja yeah. racer Steve Olegis and uh, <clears throat> he bought a Wrangler 392 oh no so he owns Team <laughs> Chevy and Team Ford here in Vegas okay and so he got a 392 in on trade and he and I um, we've known each other for a while but we really got to know each other a little bit better when we were both on the Bronco uh, expert industry expert panel yeah. during Bronco development for like five years and so he and I got to know each other, and he's like, man, you, you know a lot about a lot of stuff. And, and I got my 392, and he's like, you know, I didn't get a Bronco. And, you know, we're going back and forth. Anyway, he calls me up. He's like, hey, 
I got this 392 in train. I really like it. So um, he's like, are you coming to, to SEMA? And I said, yeah, I'll be out there. He goes, if you have any free time, um, I want you to see my new Jeep, but I want you to check out the Bronco Barn. So the Bronco Barn is uh, basically his dealership did like a quick lane uh, yeah. service station with emissions testing. Yep. They have a dyno in the back, which is yep. super rad. And they'll be able to do in uh, Nevada, where we're at, uh, there is um, diesel emissions testing yep. that's Clark required County, in Clark County. Specifically. So he'll be able to do that testing on site at the nice. quick lane. So the next door, to, and it was an old equipment rental yard. They kept one building there, and I won't tell you what's in the building that they kept, but they knocked everything else down. It's this really authentic, rustic, awesome, state-of-the-art shop. It's got uh, six or seven bays. It's got a clean yeah. bay for doing PPF all the way in the back. Uh, it's got computers where they can put together the packages and yeah. show you on the computer what your vehicle will look like. And then they do all makes and models, but they specialize in Bronco. And yeah. uh, I'm super proud of him because he's been talking about it forever. And it was kind of like one of those things, should we, shouldn't we? And he, and he did it. And so Is this the type of thing that we need to go and interview him? Oh, we're, we're, uh, I'll talk to you about that later. Well, I already look, have at, okay. at his core, he's yeah. a Ford guy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to give him credit for that. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, Steve, Steve knows... Uh, Performance. He's, yeah. he's been Hell of a driver. the off-road racing scene for a long time, and he's a great guy. Yeah. So I'm glad you got to do that. No, cool. it's cool. And we're, I think we're gonna we're gonna do something with him. We'll come out. Uh, maybe I should announce something. Uh, we're working on doing a in-store with them for the podcast, so our Vegas listeners could come down. Uh, maybe breaking during his, news here. Maybe through his uh, yeah. grand opening or something like that. So I didn't even know well, about this. So no, thank no, you, Peter, yeah. for asking. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about coming to Vegas and doing something. We didn't really have the right place. Right. And Steve's like, "Would you want to do something here?" And I'm like, "Yeah." So we're going to talk about that and maybe do something in spring. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Peter, so here's a teaser for yeah. for getting back together. Yeah. You guys know about diesel particulate filters? Yeah, yes. we do. Coming around the corner, gas particulate filters. Yes, we, DI, right? we, we need to stop there. All right. We got. I, no. I, we have so much more to talk to him about, yeah. but we can't do it here. I want to talk right. about we'll, gas. We'll have you come back. It's it's time. Oh, yeah. God, I'm, I'm, gas particulate filters. Please, no. <laughs> it's coming. I know. It's right, right don't, I'm not going to let you rain on our parade with yeah. that, Peter. Yeah, no, we're no, going no, to no, enjoy the SEMA. We're going to enjoy the, <laughs> the direction of things right now. Yes. We're going to have fun. All right. to talk about. We love you. Thank you. guys. All right. Thanks, Peter. You're the best. Justin. Justin from Cognito. Come on over here. This is awesome. We have like a train of people waiting Step to Step on up talk to the to mic us. right here. There we go. Yeah, you can put those on. Yeah, sure. Throw them on. Help, help here. Make sure that you got us. You got any volume us? there? Check one, wow, two. that sounds amazing. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> is it too loud in your headphones now? No, that's perfect. You're all good? Okay. Justin is the founder of Cognito, and you guys are fellow uh, Cali boys out of yep. Bakersfield, yeah, correct? Baco. Bakersfield, California. Yeah. Yep. What year is this for Cognito? Is that SEMA? No, no, no. I mean, so when, when did oh. you form Cognito? Cognito was found. I founded it in 2001 in a chicken coop in a Royal Grande, California. And I remember I was at Truck and Magazine back then, yep. and we did some of your early builds and covered yeah. the features on it because you were building big stuff nobody else was doing at the time. Yeah, I didn't want to come in and compete with your Fabtechs and Pro Comp, so we said, hey, let's go big. Let's go yeah. 10 inch, let's knock out this body lift crap. And, yeah. Uh, so let's go 10. So that's where we started and kind of built from there, literally in a chicken coop in a Royal Grande. That's awesome. So how did you, when you started this, and we don't have a ton of time, we, we I would love to have an entire episode with just you. You're the kind of guy that we would spend an hour with. We can't hear, but Anytime. take us back to that moment when you said, I'm going to build the best lifts that I possibly can. Because like you said, at that time, without naming other names, you could go up six, seven inches, but eh, like, eh, they might fold. These suspensions were not great. Yeah, we just wanted to do something different. And, you know, it's in my DNA. Whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it well. Uh, I kind of learned that from my dad. He built drag boats, drag cars, racing engines. You don't build racing engines half-assed. No. You, you got to go all out, right? So, And he was known for being the water wizard in the drag boat <laughs> racing scene. Awesome. So, you know, it's kind of in my DNA to build good stuff, and, and so that was the approach I took. What was your background? Were you a mechanical engineer? Yeah, or? I went to Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Oh, my, my son's going there, yeah. second year. Mecha yeah. Mechanical engineering, so I got my bachelor's of science in, in mechanical engineering. Graduated in 2000, got a, ended up getting a job in San Luis Obispo at a place called Advanced Aerospace. And, uh, you know, it was kind of starting Cognito on the side a little bit until the 9-11 tragedy happened. Uh, yeah. Got laid off from that because it was a bunch of aerospace type sure. stuff. Mm. And just got every credit card I could. I worked at Boeing it. at the time. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know. I know. Just got every credit card I could and just went for it. And, and uh, man, it just 
no options. Just just no options. Burn the boats. Yeah. So well, when when you well, real quick, I want to know more about the chicken coop. Yeah. Yeah. I, serious. So so what what was it on your property? Was it? No. Some, well, tell me about it. Yeah. So I didn't have any property over there at the time, but uh, if if you're familiar with Aurora Grande, you'd probably know where I'm talking oh, about. Oh yeah. A very small town. Los Barros. Uh, Los Barros Road and El Campo, and up on the hill there was a bunch of chicken coops, 700 feet long, 50 feet wide, and I had a 60 foot section of one. So I had 3,000 square feet. It was 17 cents a square foot. It was all I could afford. Oh my God. <laughs> but, it, but it had three phase power. And well, there you uh, go. You know the floor. Well, wait, why does the floor a chicken clean? coop? Wait, why does a chicken coop have three ag, phase power? Ag, it was Agland, okay. so it had three phase. Which Plus was they got to keep those eggs warm and the machine <laughs> to like sort them out. I and, guess. Okay. Yeah. So probably the, making that up. But. Floors were super wavy. You know, they're just mopped <laughs> concrete floors. Chicken crap everywhere. <laughs> uh, chicken wire windows. And I literally went to Home Depot. Got you know sh- uh, plywood. Hinges, ropes, and pulleys, like literally boarded up all these chicken wire windows. Put, you know, on four of them, put pulleys and ropes so I could just winch up a window, open it during the day while I was working. I mean, I was the welder, I was the machinist, I was the sales guy. I kind of did it all until I got some part time help in there. Some students coming in and helping machine, and then a welder. Little internship in over yeah. at uh, Cal Poly. Yeah, I literally washed my hands in a bucket, you know, in the shop there and uh, used the outhouse down the road. I mean, that's what it was. When the, when the tubing truck showed up, I was unloading it by hand. How long? Were you there before you moved into your like your first real building? Yeah, so it was time, you know, in uh, late 2003. It was time for a real a real shop. I just couldn't afford anything in San Luis Obispo. So uh, May, March of 2004, I moved back to Bakersfield. A little help from my parents. Got a 2,500 square foot shop there. Ended up picking up the unit next door to it, and then another <laughs> another unit on the next street, and then two more next to it. Started building yourself a campus. Just yeah. So was I it was, always called Cognito? And if yeah. not, so where did the name come from? Okay, well. Good question. Those were from the partying days in college, right? Before before business. I, I was in school and had some buddies over from Bakersfield and we're partying and telling stories about the previous night. And I was just looking for a word that was opposite of incognito, a word opposite yeah. of incognito. I was trying to think of one. I'm like, well, that would be cognito. I'm like, but that's not a real word. It's not. Is it in the dictionary? No, it's not in the dictionary. But that'd be a cool business name someday if I ever had a business. And then two years later, you got a business. Go. I got a business, and I got there a business go. name. How so did, that's how it came. So you decided to. What was your first lift uh, as far as height? Ten inch. Ten inch lift. And okay. what, what was the vehicle? Uh, half ton Chevy, yep. eighty eight. And how did you know the ge- obviously mechanical engineer? But how did you know the geometry that you wanted to? Because you have a signature look, and you always have, right? Yeah. And it's something that guys and all these GM trucks and other trucks. It, it's, it's, it's been replicated by lots of people. Correct. Over You've been ripped off a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know that. But but you guys still want the OG. They want your brand name. They want it built here in America. All that stuff. So how did you how did you first start? Like how did you know that geometry? Well, you know, I started with. It's the things I learned from engineering school, obviously triangulation, things like that. That's where that big X front cross member yep. came from. Which is That's kind of the signature of, yeah. of your drop down was that cross member. Exactly. Yeah. You could see that thing coming from a mile away, right? Yeah. Um, so it kind of started there. Um, how did I do it? You know, honestly, I'm way better at doing this stuff now, of course, than I was back then. I didn't know everything back then. Learned a lot along the way. Back then, everybody was doing upper control arm drops. So right. you drop the upper control arm down as well as the lower control arm. Well, because you didn't have spindle kits back then. Spindle kits came more in, uh, I don't know, 2003 or four yep. or somewhere around there. Yeah, um, kind of started on the uh, tool drive free runners and then kind of got yeah. over to the, the other love kits. So, you know, I always thought, okay, they're doing it because they don't want to drop that upper control arm down. But one day I'm like, all right, let me, I'm going to do the math here. So I bust out my calculator and my engineering formulas and I start running math and I'm like, whoa. You run the spindle kit, upper ball joint's way higher off the ground now. This thing just got four times stronger. Okay. This the is leverage amazing. is in your favor now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just imagine taking stock geometry, moving it down, you know, 10 inches and putting this massive tire on there. You're just overpowering the geometry. Um, so now with spindle kits, you know, everything gets taller. As, as tire scales, so does your spindle height. Upper control arm is that much further away from lower control arm. You just got more leverage over the tire now with a spindle kit. Um, so we started doing that, I don't know, around 2005 or six. jumped over to spindle kits, just saw the benefit there, and just built, you know, just, just kept developing and learning along the way and just wanted to make it better and better and better. And Do you, you know where any of your early kits are? Like, are they still driving around? Do you ever get a customer call you and you're like, oh, my God, bring it here. I just want to see what I did, you know, 20 <laughs> Pro- years ago. Probably in Louisiana or Mississippi or something <laughs> yeah. like that, I bet. But I do see a couple old trucks running around Bakersfield. That's cool. You know, like 07, something Do you ever think, like, ah, like, oh, man, that lasted longer than I thought? <laughs> it do. I'm going, well, that's cool to see it still lasting. Powder coat's still there. Yeah. yeah. That's me, dude. I'm really 
picky about stuff, so I don't want to, I don't want to phosphate wash my steel parts and then powder coat because you're, it's only the finish is going to last two years. Yeah. I media blast yeah. my stuff so that I can put a quality. So powder there's a coat nice, on basically it. what you're doing is etch you're creating, it. yeah, you're you're creating a, a surface to for the powder yeah. coat to adhere to. Yeah, you've got to etch that metal and get that laser slag well, off of there. And your cross members too are, I mean, they're in the, the windstream, so they're smashing bugs, they're getting rocks, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So that's an area yeah. that you know it's the first thing you see, but it's also the first thing to take the brunt of off-roading or rock chips yep. or all the things that are on the road. Yeah, so to, today to see, you know, 18-year-old trucks still rolling around Bakersfield with this Cognito lift kit on it and my old school logo on the, you know, yeah. that's, it's, it's pretty neat. That's it's still cool. holding up. So, yeah, I did. That it. wasn't the only thing. You were also uh, making advancements in the in the steering. Yep. Like, you had to strengthen the steering yep. as well because I remember well, those, GM, in, those GMT 400 and 800 trucks were not great I had, steering. I, 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 had, I had someone else's kit on my truck but I had your steering equipment because yep. it was the only thing out there that actually did what it promised to do. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much time we got, but I could tell you the story of how that came about. Yeah, let's do it. I love it. Okay. You, all, you guys heard of Doug DeBerti? Uh, yes, know of Doug. course. Okay. Yeah. Trends, right? Well, yeah. Doug's Doug and a friend Brad. of mine. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> Bakersfield boys, right? So Doug's like, hey, I got this new 08 Chevy HD. I want to build it for SEMA. Let's go with the biggest kit you got. I'm going to put 40s on it. Okay. I, and I need you to build it for me, please. Well, okay. at, at that time, what was the biggest tire that you were running on? Was it 37s? 40s. 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 You were going up 40s, 40s by now? Yeah. yeah. And Doug always pushes the limit. Oh, yeah, so of course he, he does. Yeah, he's going to run 40s. Yeah, if, if somebody's doing a 40, it's like, oh, here's a 41. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So... We build the truck in my shop, my little 2,500 square foot unit, and uh, he sends a tow truck to pick it up. Now the truck's already painted, everything is done. He s drops the truck off, essentially done without suspension, <laughs> but he drops off the wheels and tires with it. So we build the truck, we get it done, and uh, he sends a tow truck with a flatbed to come pick it up. And uh, literally, we pull the truck up to the flatbed, guy drops the flatbed down, he hooks up to the truck, starts winching it up the flatbed, and I watch the, the front tires just the toe, just like toe, yeah. Oh. And I'm looking at it going, did I leave something loose? Like, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm like really worried at that yeah. point. I'm starting to wipe my forehead, right? Yeah. Uh-oh. And I'm like watching this thing, and I'm watching what's flexing, and I'm watching that drag link and the pitman arm and the eyelid arm, and they're just flexing like crazy, and I'm like, what? what is going on? As soon as the rear tires touched the deck bed of the tow truck, that stress relieved, tires went back straight. And I'm like, what just happened? It was and, and if out. you ever watch, you know, a that era IFS uh, Chevy truck going up over like a uh, whooped out hill or something, you'll watch that yeah. flex, toe in, toe out, toe in, toe right. out. And I said, I think I said that was an 08. It was actually 2006. So that was for 2005 SEMA. Okay. Anyway, we, we go to SEMA whatever whatever i kind of like put it in the back of my head well doug comes home and he's got now a hummer h2 that's got my 10 inch kit on it he's got a 20 i remember HD. that number yeah with a, with my 10 inch kit on it they start heading up to their place in big bear well it starts snowing on the way up to big bear he looks in the rear of the mirror and sees his truck whoever was driving his truck they all they all stopped and locked him in four wheel drive because it's starting to snow sure. and you got to head up the mountain right front tires are towing in like crazy and he calls me justin I don't know what's going on, but the t front tires are towing like crazy, and it just clicked immediately, and I went, I know exactly what's happening. I said, hey, when you get back, please bring me that thing. Brings it back to me. I look at it. I knew what was happening, and I literally said, hey, I could build a bracket that pivots off here, and it has a time joint here, because this just needs to pivot on well, axis. What was happening in the snow? It wasn't the snow. It was the four-wheel drive. They locked it in four-wheel oh. drive. Yeah. So they lock it in so, four-wheel drive, and they're handing up a mountain on the on the pavement. Yeah. But the, if it's starting to snow, that's why they locked it in four-wheel yeah, okay. drive. Yeah. So they're heading up. Well, you got this load because the front tires are pulling. They're so right. trying to pull together. Uh, so now you see that yeah. toe in, and so that's look at it like a tractor pull. You'll see that yeah. you know with gotcha. the tractor, right? Gotcha. Yeah. So it comes back. I look at it. And I'm like, hey, I could do this, that, that. Literally the next day, I had a prototype, and it worked. And I'm like, whoa, this is patentable for sure. Yeah. So I started calling around, found a patent attorney, a great one in, in, in Bakersfield. Was this your first that patent? History. That was my first patent. How many do you have? I have three patents. Good for you, man. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So that was that's the story of how the Pittman and Eiler Arm Support Kit was born. I mean, yeah. that revolutionized people going big tires on those trucks. Because yeah. that was the only way to drive them safe. Yeah, and I, you know, it's... <laughs> I, I'm not talking, I don't want to talk bad about any specific brands, but I'll tell you what, I feel like I'm the only one, the only brand that understands the steering in depth to be able to explain to people the problem, how it happens, and how we fix it. And it's very important. But you can put that steering kit on anybody's lift kit, almost anybody's. As Lightning um, did, you yeah. sell out. Anybody's leveling kit, stuff like that. So I think it's a really valuable Thanks. product. <laughs> <laughs> Did you envision Cognito being as big as it is today and, and, and it's such an important brand to the aftermarket? You couldn't have envisioned this. There's no way. I had no clue. 
when I started in the chicken coop in Arroyo Grande in 2000, I thought I would be retired by 35 and uh, living life, right? <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I was just yeah. a kid, right? I was yeah. just going for it. I just, you know, I wanted more out of life and I was willing to put in whatever work it took. I didn't have a clue, but I'll tell you, uh, our Christmas party last year, one of my guys that's been with me for probably eight years, he goes, man, how did you know? Like, how did you, when you started this, how did you know it was going to get to this? I go, Danny, I didn't have a freaking clue, Danny. I had no <laughs> you clue. Didn't I was just know. doing it, You were willing to take a risk. I was just doing it. Yeah. 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 I had no idea. That's amazing. So today, you're, par- you're part of Randy's Worldwide, yep. right? Yep. Isn't that the name of the, the organization? Yeah. Right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So then what, what does that mean? That means that you, you've actually been acquired. Yep. Cognito is now owned by this parent, right? Did that change anything? Are you still at the helm? What's that dynamic? I'm still at the helm. Um, now... It's just good to partner up with a bunch of other brands. We're all kind of good at our own things. But and you kind of have economies of scale for, yeah. like, manufacturing and, and for purchasing sure. raw materials and things like that, right? Yeah, so, yeah. well, some of that, okay. right? Some of that. Because f- freight is so expensive nowadays, you got to accommodate for freight. So it's yeah. not like you can have one hub where you stock all this stuff, everything gets shipped there, and then you disperse it from there. Because you're just it's, freight's going to eat you up. Yeah. So, uh, we're, so we're, you can go to FedEx and negotiate all of these companies together. Yeah. So you're under one account. Gotcha. But we're in different hubs, essentially, yeah. right? So I sold my assets of Cognito to Randy's because I want to keep growing. But I've done this for 23 years, the hard way, learning everything the hard way. And I'm just like, man, I'm 49. Uh, it's it's time to get on a rocket ship here. And I think those guys are equipped to do it. So that's why I jumped in. You know, part when I heard, oh, you guys bought Icon? Because I had no clue, dude. I'm just, dude, Dynatrack? Yeah, I'm Icon? Just, my head is buried doing my work. Yeah. And I had no idea that Icon sold to Randy's. I had no idea Carly sold to Randy's. Yeah. Dynatrack. I had no idea. So when I, I heard mean, they're that, acquiring I'm like, this, a mat, these, all of these are are basically premium, premium right. individually owned brands that have brand equity and product equity inside this industry. Exactly. And yeah. a lot of them have similar stories to yours. Yeah. Like they, they were started by real dudes solving All real problems. Yeah. So right. Carly, like Sage Carly, I met him 15 years ago on an off-road trip. And uh, now you guys go to Christmas parties together for work. <laughs> <laughs> met him, and so I, we kind of got to know each other a little bit. I'm like, this dude's a lot like me. So when I heard he sold to Randy's, I'm like, okay, there's something here. Yeah. I'm going to investigate some more. And man, So they knocked on your door? They knocked on my door. And I had a lot of people knocking on my door, but I wasn't really interested. I threw yeah. out wild numbers to him. I'm like, hey, you give me this, yeah. and you can have it. You know? But no, Randy's knocking on the door. This is the, the I don't want to do it number, right? Exactly. Meet it, and I'll change my mind. Exactly. Yeah. Make me yeah. move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they knock on my door. They kind of tell me what they're doing, who they have already acquired, what the goal is. And I'm like, this is pretty interesting. I think uh, I'm, I'm interested. So we did. I mean, was, was it scary? It was 15 months of hard work and due diligence and, gotcha. uh, and, and whatnot. But, man, is it scary? I don't know. I don't think so. No, it wasn't scary life. at that moment. No, it no. wasn't scary. Not to me. I just, you got one life to live, and I know I want to keep growing. And I, I just want to get to the point where we're profitable enough so I can pay my people who helped get us here more than average wage. I want them to be happy where they're at, stick stick around, help build a badass and company. And you want to sit on a beach with a cigar in your mouth and uh, an really. umbrella? No, no not maybe, this guy. <laughs> maybe maybe three or four days a couple times a year right. I can do that. Right. But, man, more than three or four days, I started Get start getting that itch. Yeah, itch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always joke, like, I'll never be retired because I like working too much. Totally. You know, I just, I, I, I don't know what to do with myself if I'm just always on. You know, it's, yeah. it's I've got three businesses now. Going from working in corporate, you know, the corporate world for you know my entire career to owning three businesses yeah. and go 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 go. I don't Dude. know what I would do if like all yeah. that ended tomorrow. What are we gonna do? Die? Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. we start dying. I mean, no. So people ask me, hey, what are you gonna retire? What are you gonna do? I'm like, hey, I'm not gonna retire. What would I? You know, I might as well stay here and help build this thing. Put a, throw a little equity in the deal. So I got some skin in the yeah. game, and that's what I wanted to do. So I'm like, hey, I already got it this far. We can keep going. I can. I got a lot to learn, right? Do I want to start over from scratch and get back to where? I, no. Yeah. I want to keep learning. You know, keep learning how this works, and I, th- this team's helping me do that. So you know, that's the goal. I want to. I'm. I'm still ahead of company. I'm gonna stay on for several more years, and until I'm just. Ready. You know, can work remotely and yeah. Yeah. tell people, hey, cool, and just check in. <laughs> yeah. what's, your, um, what's your number one selling kit? And then the other question is, what is your value proposition? What if, if I'm calling in, to talking to one of your sales guys, and I'm looking at other kits on the market, yep. because you've got a lot of competition. Why Cognito? What, why Cognito? Yep. Yep. I get a lot of that today and yesterday. Why Cognito? Okay, simple. You've got a guy, pointing at myself here. 
You got a guy who understands suspension, particularly IFS and steering, and can knows how to maximize the potential of that steering that GM built, right? So I can maximize that. I know what it needs to ride good. Essentially, I know what I know what recipe I need to build. So as long as my customers follow my recipe, they're going to get the re- promised result every time. You start wandering away from my recipe, you're not going to get the result. Don't part piece stuff together. Yeah, no Franken trucks. my trucks. package, yeah. right? So would you call I'm, it a Franken truck? Franken truck. Yeah. yeah, when you Frankenstein it, when you know, yeah. Yeah. being a you know magazine guy, you know how many uh, builds do we have over the years where we include forty seven manufacturers and we're like, oh, yeah. no, it doesn't really work really well. Yeah, generally, you know, it, it's 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 all about maximizing droop travel, and then you can take some of that droop travel and convert it into ride height. And you yep. and, and the goal is to have enough droop travel so the truck truck still rides great. Yep. Doesn't pull you down. Better than stock. Yep. Okay, that's that's the whole goal. So that's part of my recipe. There's other things in the recipe that are not just parts. It's the setup, which means the installation and then the right height setup, alignment and all that. When you do all that right, that's all part of the recipe. Success. Nice. Right? And then your most popular kit. Like, what are you known for today? HD. I mean, HD is our meat and potatoes. Of course, GM is our meat and potatoes. But out of GM, we got 1500 and then we got, I call it six lug and eight lug, right? Yeah. Eight lug is definitely the the, the bigger Brutus there um, of our market share. Um, leveling kits are hot, especially on these newer trucks, the 2020 and up HDs, because they already come pretty tall, and you can get 35s yeah, under them pretty really easy. Tall. And now you get them ride better in stock. Yeah, you can get them from the factory on a on a eight <coughs> excuse me AV edition Bison. You get 35s. That's what I got over there. Yeah, which is a, which yeah. is a great truck. And then you look at um, when they went from torsion bars on the 1500s to coilovers. Yeah. Was that a big deal for you from a suspension manufacturing standpoint? It was it, way better setup, but even look at uh, so you got 07 to 18, 2007 to 2018, you got you were on coilovers. But when they came out with the new platform for 2019, much better geometry, mm. everything works better. There's more potential there. Yeah. Man, they're really really good trucks. I bought one in 2019, thinking, all right, I'm going to use this to develop some product, then I'm going to get back in my HD. I kept that because I'm like, this is a badass <laughs> truck. Yeah, and they built that so. It's funny, uh, I know some of the, the engineers on that, and the chief engineer called me one day and he goes, I fixed your steering wheel for you. And I said, finally, because I used to bitch that the steering wheel was always offset, offset in those oh. trucks. And so that was <laughs> yeah. the first one where they finally centered it on yeah. the, on the we seat have, again. Sh- literally, this guy has ruined so many, uh, he's, made so many he's made so many unhappy listeners. They're like, they didn't <laughs> They're know. They're driving in their truck, and yeah. I talk about that, and they're like... Oh, oh, no. no. They, now working. you can't unsee it. Yeah. Can't unsee it. And one guy's like, I just got a brand new work truck. I had it for a couple of days. I loved it. And then I heard your podcast and I looked down and I was like, damn it, it bugs Son me every day I drive it. So anyway, he called me about that. But the, the reason that that truck is so good and has potential is because they built it with factory lift kits in mind for Trail Boss and things like that. And so they actually designed that to have a factory potential, which you could, of course, exploit oh, with yeah. what you're doing, which is awesome. It's And it still has a lot of potential for performance. Yeah. We're able to get one more inch of height out of it and still and, and, and give that thing a lot more performance than it has stock. So, you know, dude, I, I really love the half tons. Um, that's what I drive every day. But if I'm towing, it's a it's an HD for sure. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Right on, man. Congratulations on all the success. Thank you. This Appreciate is huge. Thanks we wanted to talk to you for a long time. Thanks for yeah, hanging out with us. It. Good to meet you guys. All right, cool. Thanks, uh, Justin. I'd like to buy you a beer. They're free, dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? This, this isn't your first podcast, is it? What kind of YouTuber hasn't done a podcast I thought before? you guys all did podcasts. It's about growth. <laughs> growth. <laughs> well, you'll see all sorts of growth here. So if you look at, uh, at Dawn of Dawn's life on his YouTube channel, you're, you'll see a new C8. You'll see it looks like he's got a... Not a suburban or an Escalade. He's got an Escalade. He's got it. Hopefully, he's no, got no, no. an that's old da, Don's wife. That's Don's wife yes. of Don's life. <laughs> yes, it has, has the, the Escalade. Oh, I got yeah. it. Got it. He, straight baller right here. All right. So you're from Ontario, Canada. No. 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 Where oh. are you from? This says. Uh, oh, Ontario, California. Yeah. But you're E-G-R, from Canada. Yeah, it's Canada. Which Lightning has been there before. I live in. They had to kick him out. Saskatoon. Okay. Yeah. That's where I live currently. So our number two biggest uh, market is it's not Saskatoon. Canada. No, it's no. <laughs> Canadians love us. Yeah, most of them. Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> the ones we haven't insulted. <laughs> well, hey. you. Yeah. The ones not listening to AM radio. Yeah, we're exactly. I don't exactly. insult them. Okay. So wait, Saskatoon. Where? East coast, west coast? Uh, it's Western Canada. Western it's Canada. the center of Saskatchewan. It's four and a half, five hours. Southeast of Edmonton. Okay, so you were the guy, you, you were the ones that uh, have no like emissions ish laws, like your Correct. crazy Wild West. We register right? our vehicle and we do whatever we want to it, yeah. unless it's tint. We're really that's the oh. line. Do you ever look at them and go, really, that's the line? 
the mud slide and, and mud flaps recently. I had a oh, yeah. real really? video with that. They yeah. don't care about your rolling coal, but if you yeah. if they walk up and they can't see the the dude in the car, they freak. See, our Canadian listeners often, uh, you know, they like to they like to poke us about that, you know, yeah. taunt us with their uh, freedom up there. You guys are more free in some ways than we are. Not all of them, but. Yeah, it's a give and take. Yeah, yeah a little bit some, of a give and take. There's some parallels. And some <laughs> yeah, there are big gaps. Yeah, it's a big gap. Yeah, it's been okay. recently. So we need to know your background, and then we also need to know what you're doing with the channel now. So every channel's got a hook, right? Whether it's engineering explained, and he digs into the engines, or or it's, it's you with your channel. And I'm looking through. You got a lot of HD content, but let's back up before you tell us about the channel. Do you have a day job? Did you have a day job? I still have a day job. Okay. I do corporate HR. Oh. Yeah, that sounds not, exciting. I deal with people and their problems, <laughs> and I problem solve. But my, my that's mom how I did uh, to be HR, so there's a special place in heaven for you. I, uh, it, it, that's hard. <laughs> it's a hard job. People it, are weird. <laughs> it's hard. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. It's difficult. Okay. But it's so fun. you're doing HR for for a big company, or yes. you're like you're okay. Yeah, I try to keep my work, my day job separate from my YouTube, which is. Do you ever have to do like a? Um, uh, performance improvement plan, a PIP, and they walk in, they're like, oh, I watch your YouTube channel. They're like, oh, this is going to be a really awkward conversation. Not in that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that there's a few people that I meet for the first time. So I, I travel, I cover an area in Ontario, Canada, okay, uh, where we're most populated. And I also cover a little bit in the prairies where I live. And uh, somebody will recognize me from that first. <laughs> and I try to push that aside, <laughs> deal with the business part, and then uh, the same speech I'm giving you, I try to keep them separate. One's sure. a hobby and, <laughs> yeah. and, and one's work. And then there's that, uh, there's that bootleg uh, Instagram account called uh, Fired by uh, Don's Life. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. He keeps it separate. If it's not existing, I'm going to start it. He should. <laughs> so then how did you start the channel and what was the first vehicle? Yeah, so I started it around 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, at that time, I had, uh, you know, because I'm happily married, I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> I am, I am. Oh, you should have seen the look she just gave you. Yeah. Daggers were like oh, laser beams. You know, she's recording this, and I can see her eyes just above the side of the yeah. phone. <laughs> there needs to be some drama in YouTube. We know that. She is the uh, Department of War and Finance in your in your uh, uh, less cabinet. Finance, more war. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, I, you're going to be sleeping in different beds tonight. Just FYI. Well, when we got here, they had the room messed up, and they had separate beds. So ah. oh, night, so it works out fine. That was night oh, yeah. one. Yeah. So I'm already acclimated to that. But uh, it, it started because, well, I've done this stuff since I could get into a car. I mean, my first car was a K car. Then it was a 67 Chevelle that was pretty rough. Um, worked on that as I could through high school, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to married life and uh, 2019. And I'm like, you know what? I've been doing all these mods forever. I have a sister that's an influencer for a bunch of outdoor Toyota stuff in Canada. Oh. Um, so she does pretty good with that. And I'm like, well, I could do this. I'm cooler than my sister, right? <laughs> We're supposed to be. And uh, I mean, I, I think that about my sister. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I love I, you, Lisa. <laughs> and I have a sister named Lisa, but this is Lindsay. But either way, I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm going to start documenting this stuff and put it on YouTube. If people watch, they watch. Who cares? Once I get over that part that I'm not getting any better looking and yeah. just getting older. You, and you're doing it for you. Exactly. Yeah. So I just started putting it out there, and my first... Isn't that our ethos? That's why we're on podcasting. We're not, we're get, not getting we're younger. Not getting, we're not getting, not getting better. Getting better. Yeah, the audio works great for us, so... Perfect. Well, video seems to be working, but uh, <laughs> maybe people feel better as they keep watching. My dad passed away in 2009, and out of that whole you know debacle, once that was all figured out, I made sure I kept the 3100 uh, 1956 Chevy Cameo. Um, so that was one of the first vehicles on the channel, but it doesn't really need anything done to it. It's not stock, but it's it's good. You can drive it on Sunday, go to a car show, bring it home, and it's good. And then uh, I bought a BMW M4, and I thought that was going to launch my YouTube success. It did not. And then I bought my 2021 GMC Sierra AT4, started doing some mods on it, and the channel blew Exploded. up. Exploded. Wow. It did. Yeah. What do you suppose the difference was? It was just was there too much would too much BMW content or That's just probably it? Okay. I couldn't ever really put my finger on it. Because um, there's like too many daily driven well, exotics well, to other, compete with, right? The other thing I'm curious about too is Maybe. what are your demographics? Are you pulling more from the States way or from more, Canada? Yeah, way okay. More. Texas and California. Yeah. Oh amazing. Probably make up about 80, well, I think it's because 70%. of your Texas accent. Yeah, <laughs> about that. The about that. <laughs> yeah, lots of U.S. Probably 88, 90 percent U.S. Wow. viewership. Okay. And then Canada, and then the rest is uh, Middle East and uh, 
Canada, obviously, and yeah, UK. So you start with this at what year was the HD you said? When you say HD, you mean the Your HD4? Truck. Yeah, it's a yeah. 1500. It okay. might just look bigger than it is because okay. of some of the stuff I've done to it. But uh, I started that February 2021. I reached out to EGR to ask a question about their mud flap or their, uh, sorry, fender flares. Did and that they tire, said, tire coverage. Yeah, and they're like, we're just going to send them to you. And then that's when our relationship kind of kicked off. And that's why I'm kind of in front of you today. But yeah, uh, yeah. And are you running the roll track on there as well now? I'm running the electric roll track. Yeah. So I also what do you think about that? Because we know what we think about it. He's got one on his TRX. Curious, your, your thoughts. I've owned trucks for most of my adult life. Yeah. And I've had several tonneau covers from the, you know, roll up ones to the flip overs to the like backflips and things like that. Hands down, this is my favorite tonneau cover ever. And it's industrious. That's the word I've been using lately as I kind of like see what else is out there. I mean, it can hold the weight. I can stand on it if I need to, which I don't typically do. Um, but if I take my build in another direction, which I might go a little more overlander style while I still have this truck, I don't have to worry about what I stack on, to, on it, yeah. you know? Or so, you can use uh, a Leitner uh, rack that goes in the T-slot on the cha- on the rails, which is exactly, awesome. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I was testing their sport bar when it first came uh-huh. out to this market, and uh, I've been running that for a while, and I get awesome. a lot of questions about that. And I, okay. I love this setup. I mean, I can't see enough good things. I, and I talk a lot about the engineering, and I don't know if that translates to the average person, because that's what excites me about it. I look at the the engineering, and of course, it's an Australian company. Mm-hmm. A lot of stuff is built in the U.S. as well, in Ontario, California. But the the, the roll track system is so well engineered, and I have to say, like German engineering, it's not. It's Australian engineers. I think that would resonate with people. They're like, oh, they understand that German engineering oftentimes is better, right? And I liken it to that. And I don't know if, but do you feel the same way that the, the engine when you when I opened the box and I looked at the way that everything was laid out? The, the jig that it comes with so you can make sure that it's square on your bed when you and nothing was left there was no room for error you weren't going to screw up you know they prevented that it, it's just it's amazing I'll you, tell you there's a lot of Australian companies one of the things that they do really well is the way they package for installation and uh, there's other companies that everything you you open the box there's no guesswork like it's 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 foolproof but the tolerances are perfect so anyway I want to get your take on it yeah so you mentioned the jig so we did the whole setup. Actually, Mrs. Dawn's life helped me with the hard part, lifting it onto the uh, bed rails. And, uh, you know, in that video, you'll see that when we put it together, you don't really see me use the jig because everything lined up so square and true that there was no resistance opening and closing the box during, like, the, the test and, calibrations. And really, and that, to shim it or whatever, is because of the tolerance in the bed itself, not yes. in the product, right? Yep. It's because right. these trucks aren't always made square, but well, that product I've is. measured some rams in my day job, and I've measured up to a half an inch off across X. The, the, you know, if you go diagonally across the truck, a half an inch, it's off. Like, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, Stellantis is not so good. <laughs> but uh, GM is off, too. I just, so they account for that by giving me this jig. Yeah, they do. And, uh, you know, the installation... It can, at first glance, if you look at the instruction manual, you stuff like, what did I get myself into? But <laughs> yeah. honestly, just follow the steps. Actually, watch my video, and uh, you'll get through it pretty easy. Okay. Yeah, at Don's Life on YouTube. Yeah. So then what's the current project? Are you still working on this 1500? Or? I am, and okay. the C8 Corvette. Okay. Um, so, I mean, there was some drama when I first bought the C8. People were happy, like, oh, you bought the C8. But then I started making videos for it. But I was conscious of my audience that were watching for the truck content. So I, I put a little blurb in some of the videos early on when I got the car. That this is I'm not still, a truck. <laughs> I'm still going to do GMC Sierra videos yeah. and truck content. And I try to make my truck content in such a way that it's got a universal appeal. You could have a Ford. You could have a Ram. It doesn't matter. Probably a domestic truck would be easier to kind of relate. Sure. Um, but I still foster that audience. And then my C8 is just a branch on the tree. So if you're into C8s or you know, domestic sport cars, then there's stuff there for you too. Okay, so it's uh, Don's Life is the YouTube channel, and we suggest you go over for some entertaining and educational content. Probably better than this show. Uh, I'm, yeah, it's, I, without it's having all watched in it, the yes. Details. But, <laughs> but if you uh, buy a EGR Roll Track, use our code, not his. Oh, does he have a code? I'm I guessing do. he probably does. Don's Life. 
<laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll mute that. <laughs> you have the power here. But uh, no, it's a pleasure, guys. I, uh, awesome. We appreciate I've the been listening time. for a while. And, Thank and you. You're easy to speak with. So. Nice. Thank you. Congrats on having the fun with the channel. You know, that's and, the nicest uh, compliment we've had all day. I just ignored it. You need one. I don't, I'm not used <laughs> to nice well, compliments. You don't know how to handle compliments, no. do you? I just move right past it. <laughs> you'll reflect later and you'll feel good. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, we got uh, Jason Sonora with us. Pro Speed Off Road, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Where are you out of? Uh, we just moved to Glendora. From? From Fullerton. Oh, okay. Oh, dang. Not wow. too far. Yeah, I'm yeah. over in Azusa, 605 210, behind the Miller, well, every what was I, the Miller Brewing plant? Yeah. That was Pabst Blue Ribbon. Every time I tell someone Glendora, they're like, oh my God, how far did you guys move? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, it's not Glendale. Yeah, yeah it's, right. Glendora. it's Glendora. 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 Yeah. So yes. we just tell people uh, Raging Waters. Well, well Raging, you, you yep. know how it is in SoCal. Uh, it's it's how far you moved in time. It's not miles, because miles is not well, a we, big deal. We did that. So, <laughs> so first we said we moved to Glendora, and nobody knew where that was. Yeah. So we're like 19 minutes away. Oh, okay. Yeah. San Gabriel Valley. So where Valley. did you move? Uh, Auto Club Raceway, it, right? <laughs> yeah. Can well, you say that? Nah, that's, no. that's Fontana. It, it's been interesting. Yeah. So now we just no, have no, this not the Fontana, really big the one map. In, in, in Pomona, because that's oh, close. Oh, the Raceway, not the Speedway, yes. which is no longer there because they're building stuff. Oh, I guess anyway. So. You know I'm what's awesome is, uh, is we're after hours, and we can be as loud as we want now. Or maybe we shouldn't be as loud because we're not competing with no, the we're not. No, we're not race. having to scream over anyone. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. So how long have you been in business? What do you what do you do out there? We've been in business for 17 years. We started back in 2008. And a uh, little funny side story, I told my barber that uh, I quit my job, really got fired for the fourth time. Oops. And <laughs> I was going to start my own business. And she was like, you do realize we're in a recession, right? I said, yeah, I know, but I got a plan. Well... It's, it's worked. So. Well, it's good. <laughs> what so, was the plan? Could you help me with uh, my plan? The plan was to uh, upset or piss off my former boss. Uh, oh, I've my, been part of that plan yes, also. Yes, yes. <laughs> I actually shook hands with him and, and chatted with him yesterday, which was really funny because the first time we've talked. But, yeah, 17 years ago, I, I had an idea uh, that I could do it better. I could sell the parts that I wanted to sell, install the brands that I wanted to sell, um, and not have to sell parts that I didn't want to sell. Um, and so, you know, we went off on a young mission to be the best and, and uh, develop a legacy of, of building cars and, and not being. F- I, I'll never forget. I got written up because I wouldn't sell some of the stuff in the warehouse or the spiff model that you uh, knew well, wasn't right like for your we customer. Need to, we need it. W- can you can you tell us what you were selling without outing no. the, your, your no. boss? No, no? <laughs> it, it, it's a very popular brand. Okay, but it's entry level. Okay, we can say that. And usually um, there is some money behind it as a salesperson to push it out the door, but it might not always be right for your the, customer. The, the company purchased the inventory before I came on, um, and so they had like ten to fifteen thousand dollars of stale inventory, mm. and they're like, "Why aren't you selling that?" And I'm like, "Cause it's crap." <laughs> yes, why it's um, stale? Well, we got to sell it. Well, I didn't tell you to buy it. There was a lot of budding heads when I got into the industry. Um, I have very strong uh, integrity or, or oppositions to parts that don't work. Um, that particular brand, I almost lost my life a few years before. Uh, I'm almost going to not try to give them away, but the throttle body stuck wide open. Oh, uh, wow. It was a 2000 Mustang, oh. and I was playing and on, uh, messing around on Beach Boulevard, going to Huntington Beach, and uh, I hit the throttle a little too hard, and a piece of the casting came out and wedged the throttle body wide open. Uh-oh. Um, and so, you know, stuff like that just kind of molded me to... Understand the engineering, understand where the parts are made, how they're made, where their uh, where their place is in the fishbowl, you know, um, and just only partner with companies that are not going to do that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the industry wants to sell those entry level parts. Price points are where they're at. But you know, for me, it's about legacy. Uh, when I pass away, I, you know, and, and when when God takes me home. Uh, I want a list of, of cars that, that are remembered. You can't do that with, with low quality parts. Yeah. So that's kind of that was the mission in 2008. So what are you building today? What is your client list look like? Uh, ooh, should we do a uh, shout out to Carter over there? Carter! <laughs> By the way, the now it's louder because there's no one standing here. in front of the speakers. By the way, did you see BJ Baldwin walk by? Uh-huh. Yeah. Did the beer the b- draw ballistic up? BJ? We still have beer yeah. over there, right? Currently, I'm building a uh, 2018 Raptor for an NFL player. That's super cool. We're uh, rocking out a uh, roll tracks on it. We're doing a BDS suspension. 
Mickey Thompson tires. We're running some uh, the new. That's HRE. really good. That Carter from BDS just walked through the booth when you said uh, that. So, uh, <laughs> BDS. That was a that was a really perfect tie-in right, right there. That worked for everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So we're gonna set it up. We're all we're gonna powder coat all the suspension fox orange. Super excited. We're gonna run the new HRE off-road wheels. Um, I can't remember the model number. Uh, FT1s. He ha- FT1s. He has yeah, yeah, TRX. Yeah, TRX, yeah, right? I, mean, I love those You're wheels. going down a list of like really premium parts, just H- like you said. HRE, you know, I, I've, I've spoke to Alan Flow Feltier. form? Oh, yes. Okay. Beautiful. Light, low, you know, affordable price. I love not, the moment you guys are having uh, right mm-hmm. now. Well, you know, when you, when you sell quality parts like, and you have people who understand, you know, flow form, and how that process happens, you, you understand the weight savings, yeah. the brake Strong, savings, strength, the yep. performance gains, like the strength, the strength, hitting a curb and still being able to roll. Mm-hmm. Um, I was down in uh, the circuits of America and I saw a Ferrari hit a cur- lost c- the corner, uh, hit a curb with a flow form on it, hit that curb at probably 85 miles an hour. Jeez. Car went up onto the curb and kept rolling. Now, you take a cast wheel like that and you, you bust it, you're flipping that car and you hope to walk away. Or a carbon fiber wheel, for that matter, if you right. shatter. true. So, you know, quality parts, I mean, you know, the secret of my success has not really been me. It's been the quality parts. So that brings us to you have a partnership with EGR. Yes. And uh, that's why we're enjoying uh, our time here in the EGR booth here at yeah. SEMA. So let's talk about that a little bit. So last year, uh, it was 4th of July weekend, ironically enough, and... Uh, yeah, I was at some family's house, and I, I, I was kind of bored, and so I developed a logo. We'd been getting trucks and trucks and trucks uh, for about five years, um, unprovokedly. Um, they were coming to our Mustang business because we're working on Ford, so they trusted us. And uh, last year, I decided to uh, branch off and, and start an official division. Uh, so we started Pro Speed Off-Road, and... Uh, it's been it's been a crazy ride in a year. You know, we, we started with a, a really cool logo, and we sold more apparel in the last year than we have in the previous 17. But uh, you know, we set out with the same mantra of quality parts. You know, uh, unparalleled craftsmanship. Um, if you want your car done in 20 minutes, you're coming to the wrong shop. Um, you know, we're going to do it right. Um, like for example, we're taking a BDS suspension and we're stripping it all down. We're powder coating it. Fox Orange. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the NFL player we're building for, he loves the orange, uh, and it kind of worked out. Um, so we're doing that. But, you know, it, it takes a level of dedication and not profit to put the, the, the build first, you know. And I'm not going to make any money off of powder coating, but this truck's going to sit there for a week. But when it's done, it makes the products that we're using look good. Well, it's also become it's word of mouth, too. Yeah. yeah, it's word of mouth. And, and I have a feeling that's how you're finding your clients, right? They're coming to you now. For 17 years, I've never spent a dollar in advertising. Wow. Ever. Wow. So uh, no banner ads, no – I mean, a, if you call a business card marketing, sure, but that's not advertising. Yeah. Um, grassroots, uh, you know, I go to a lot of events. Um, this year I've been to King of the Hammers. I've been to um, – Gosh, I can't think of the one that's at Prim. Um, I'm drawing a blank. The Mint? The Mint. Yeah, I went to the Mint 400. Um, You know, we've done Sands Expo. We did our first booth as a business at the uh, Sand Swap, which was super awesome. Uh, We met a lot of great folks out there. Um, We just did Off-Road Expo. Um, You know, it's been a year and a half to see the growth that we've had. The truck market is 55% of my shop right now. I have more trucks than I do cars. How many bays? Uh, We're at seven bays. Wow. Um, That is considering, uh, including our our build uh, studio that we've got. Um, So we actually have a room built for final assembly. Uh, So like we've got a 66 Mustang. So it's like a clean room? Yeah. Okay. But sexy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's really sexy. Um, So we've got that. but it, it's, it's about the efficiency. You know, we were able to build out this building the way we wanted it, um, you know, and it, to have all the machinery that we do. I mean, in the Ford world, we actually have a vertical mill. We've got a hydraulic mandrel two bender. Wow. We've got an industrial bandsaw. We've got a MIG and a TIG. And uh, I mean, we can, we're almost a full fab shop. Um, but I've learned, you know, in this industry, most parts require, you know, we, we have a saying, every, every part requires three modifications to fit. Um, that was one of the reasons we partnered up with EGR. I was going to say, no mods. No mods. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, in the truck world, I feel like because the, 
the brands are bigger and the companies have more engineering, we find a lot less problems, if any, for that matter, you know, which is not what we've experienced with some of the manufacturers in, in the Ford world. But when I could take something out of a box and not have missing parts, we ordered a supercharger one time from a major company, which I will not say, and the whole bracket was opposite mirrored. <laughs> Oh, no. Oops. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's some interesting stuff. But, uh, you know, dealing with the truck world and partnering with the best companies, um, we don't have those problems. And it's it's been nice. But, you know, if I I mean, EGR is an engineering first company. Oh, I I know. I think that's the difference. There are some companies that are it's a marketing firm that happen to sell parts. They're the opposite. Right. They they. It's, it's the part first, the engineering, yeah. and then marketing later. Yeah, but I've been there, and it's mind-boggling the the level of production that yeah. they have and, and the stuff that they're doing. And I have my buddy here with me, and uh, we open the roll track, and you physically can't hear it. Yeah. And and that I, I've watched the videos over and over again. I've showed my clientele the the video of the the bodybuilder standing in the middle of it with like 450 kilogram balls. He wouldn't let me stand on his. I'm like, it'll, it'll hold me. He's like, I don't, I don't no. mess up my truck. You know, but that's nobody else has that quality. Yeah. Somebody did steal when they were trying to steal my truck. They just they stood on, on it well, and they yeah. slithered in through the back window yeah. in the TRX. But uh, it held them and it didn't even scratch. It was amazing. So yeah. so if you're in SoCal and you want to look for a good shop, how do people find you? You know, it's it's weird that you say that because it's been word of mouth. Yeah. Um, I mean, they can we've got come. a lot of mouths. Are on you this saying? Show. Are, are you subtly saying don't call you? Like you've got too much business? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah, okay. uh, All right. Do uh, not look for pro speed. No. Do not, no. <laughs> Pretend you're not listening to this interview and ignore exactly. it. <laughs> on a on a project list, we're booked out until March. Oh, wow. Uh, probably April, if I'm being honest. All right. So if you're still saving for that truck and you're going to get it sometime around summertime, <laughs> call our man Jason over yes. here. Awesome. All right. Congrats. All right. Well, appreciate you. Thank you for stopping by. Mr. James Horwill, our friend, uh, our very tall friend. It's good to see you again. Welcome oh, yeah. back to the show. Have yeah. you grown an inch since the last time we saw you? Or have no, have we shrunk? I'm wearing high heels. Oh, so are you? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Hold on a second. I'm going to take the time here. So the, the funny thing you know, is that these tables. Do you want me to sit down? <laughs> these <laughs> tables are so tall that the mic stands, the mics are pointing down, and James walks up, and we have to point it up at him. <laughs> there it goes. No, you're good. You're good. We're good. So, uh,. SEMA again. Yeah, it's great. It's we great just start doing this every year? Every year. I think it should be a regular I love it. thing. So, no, it's good to be back. It's uh, it's always a crazy time of year to come to SEMA, p- particularly coming from us. I only got in Monday night, so I've been here 48 hours, almost on the dot. Yeah, arrived in. So, this is, the, this is the day after the election. Were you yeah. in a hotel, one of the hotels last night? I heard the Ahern was crazy. It was like lesbians for Trump, and like it was all these <laughs> interesting groups. That I, were, I definitely wasn't at that party. Okay, okay, but like I've been hearing like ours was kind of mellow, the Westgate where we are. There are cheers. There, there, were, cheers. Oh, there's, there were cheers. Now, I'm not asking you to weigh in politically. I'm just saying as being an Australian, was it interesting to observe? Very, very interesting. I was, uh, it was part when I saw that Seymour was on the same time as the election. Uh, uh, yeah. It was crazy, because obviously it's a lot, lot of press back home, a lot of imagine. information, a lot of... You know, it's just everything's bigger in the U.S., right? And it's just, it's almost its own its own. You reality. just, you can't escape it. It's almost like its own reality TV series. Like, yeah. it's just watching and everyone's fixated. And, and I, next week, it'll I, be onto something else. Yeah, are you making fun of us, though? No, because no, no, I'd but, be like, are those wacky Americans? Well, like, no, I mean, I did say that I, you'd never see someone wearing, like, a... A, a MAGA hat around, but for, for the Australian party, yeah. it just wouldn't happen. Like you wouldn't have someone walking around, sort of supporting. We've one sort of, of our, created one of, our, one of our prime ministers, whoever they're voting for. That, so, that just so you, wouldn't happen. You were in professional sports, and yes. the way I equate it to is like we've all decided that it's not political parties; they're teams. teams yeah, and we put on our team jerseys. Yeah, yeah, and we forgot what we're actually fighting about. We just know, like, we're just cheering for our team now at this yeah, point, right? Exactly. <laughs> and that, look, that sort of. We, we, you know, we have it in Oz. We just had our local state election in, we're back where we're, we're based, and it, it was so mellow and just not even a thing. Yeah. There was a change in government, but it was yeah. just not a not a thing that happened. That was, you know, everyone just did it. It's compulsory to vote in Australia, yeah. so it's different to here. So you have to vote. You get a fine. Oh, if you don't oh, vote. Oh, oh, no kidding. Yeah, so okay. it's a, it's a little bit different. So it's sort what of what kind of a fine is it? Is it substantial? Like, like one hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, oh, Aussie, I mean, so that's probably. But, yeah. but but for a lot for some people that may not have a, a ton of discretionary income. That, yeah. Yeah. So, you got to vote. So anyone over eighteen, once you're registered to vote, you have to you're register in. to vote. You're in. You have to, you're and you get you'll get a letter in the mail if you didn't vote, and you got to, you can mail out early vote and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's a, so it's a little bit different. We sort of forced to vote 
for every election. Yeah. So I've been meaning to ask you this for a year. If by some chance uh, Lighting and I uh, stow away on the, the wheels of a 747 or A380 or something. <laughs> and we're uh, not frozen when it lands yeah, when and we're they, not yeah. dead. Will, will you take us out for beers in, yeah, uh, in Australia? I'd love to come out for beers, definitely. Uh, we'll show you a good time. I love yeah, Australia. We'll show you a good time. So in the year that we've, I'm going to pretend like we don't know what's going on with the EGR, and I'll ask yeah. you cold. What has changed in the last year at EGR, either product-wise, company-wise? Well, I think the biggest thing for us product-wise in the U.S. is our increase of SKUs of our roll track. That's yeah. been our biggest push and, and manual and power Ma manual and power yeah. so we've gone from probably about seven skews so we just had the five and a half foot beds for the 1500s for the big three really and the gladiator obviously the jeep now we've gone the full range so we've got up to 28 skews we've got the six and a half foot beds five and a half foot beds for the big three all the toyotas now so the tundra and the tacoma and also the backdated tacoma and tundra that's going to do um, well for you so that's yeah. that's given us the range and then obviously the new rangers come out here which is the global platform so that's yep. been our biggest seller in Australia. That is vying there. for first place with Hilux, right? Back and forth yeah, with the best-selling so, truck so the, down there? Well, it's the recent stats that have come out. It's still the number one selling yeah, okay. vehicle. No, so not a vehicle. Truck, so oh. vehicle. Right, wow. so it's like the F-Series here, you know, number one selling vehicle in the, in the U.S. The Ranger is the number one selling vehicle in Australia, period. That's at crazy. The moment. So it's our biggest seller in Oz and also in the U.K. We've, we've had some good success with the roll cover there. So that's now launched and it's on, it's on our booth here at SEMA. So that's a global platform. So that gives us a, a good opportunity to spread it out here in the U.S. I feel like so we're standing next to a gorgeous um, white Denali. Yes. Uh, ultimate. Yep, ultimate. And it's, it's loaded. Uh, you got, uh, of, of course, it looks beautiful. You guys got a bunch of mods on. But the most important thing is the roll track right yes. here, right? Uh, 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 electric this is the, roll this track. Is the six, uh, six, six and, and a half, half foot bed. bed. So yeah. it's like the Super Duty. Yeah. So we were waiting for a little while for this one. Like yeah. you were, it's one of the newer releases, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's only, yeah. We, we'd only been out a, a number of months max for the. I feel like the number of, at least in Southern California where, where we are, this will end up being your bestseller. Yes. This one right here. Because every guy all, who. All the luxury truck guys, they want to have a trunk. Yes. Right. Yeah. So uh, look, I think that's that's the the messaging we came back. We obviously launched in the market with this with this motor truck. Yeah. So the feedback, you know, we had the, the team over here, you know, a lot of feedback from the market saying, hey, you need the full range, the yeah. six and a half foot beds, the, you know, I guess you call them standard beds, yeah. the short beds. Yeah. But for us, these are these trucks are massive. And you, you can know, still get an so, eight on top of this. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah. we're. we're we're going. Well, this is the this is the market. This yeah. is where the people put the roll. I mean, this on. is a hundred thousand dollar truck. Yeah. So this is where the money is too. This yes. this guy who owns this yeah. truck has the money to buy yeah. this, and he wants and, the best. And he, well, yes. he, and he wants the functionality that this adds. Yeah. Right. No. Exactly. And so look, we've we've listened and we've we've, you know, gone through painstakingly gone through skew by skew and built the trucks we be believe are there. And now, this you know, with the big three we call them, and then the the Toyotas. Uh, you know, we feel we've completed that full range of, of no, not completed the full range, but it's given us a bigger range to go to market with. Now, I'm kind of curious. Obviously, we've talked about the engineering that went inside of it, but in the over, you know, OVR magazine, which is my, yeah. my other business, right? Overlanding space. I've been really shocked at how many people have used the T-Tracks that are built into the roll track in the T-slots there in order to add other accessories, whether it's your sport bar, whether it's racks, mm -hmm. something like the Lightner setup, yep. whatever, because they love the idea of being able to have their bed open, closed, and still have storage on top. Has that been sort of the, the big differentiator? Is that the big win for you guys on well, the product? I think for us, when we were building and designing the roll cover, we worked out that people want to buy a, buy a pickup, buy a ute, or whatever we call it, so they want to use it for what what it's built for. That's what you bought the car for. So, you are, you know, by putting a cover on it, we understand you restrict space, but we want to be able to put stuff on top of it because that's what people want to do. So they want to load, they want to put their bikes, they want to put their overland racks, they want to put their rooftop tent. So by putting the cover on the, the bed rails gives us that weight advantage. So we're at a 700, 750 pound static weight load. So you can put a good amount of weight. You can do a rooftop tent on, on, on top, top of it easy, if you want to, yeah. On top of that. And that's why we've designed it to sit on top of the bed rail. So it gives you that more strength. Yeah. And that's why it does connect to the bed. So it's, it's sort of bolted in, not, not clamped right. in. So it, gives you, it makes you feel part of the vehicle. Well, in, in the way you guys have designed the extrusion for the yeah. bed rail caps, it, it doesn't look aftermarket. No. And so it doesn't look like it's an accessory. I, mean, I think some people are like, oh, I want flush. But when they see this, it doesn't detract yeah. from the style of the truck, which is a big deal. No, exactly. And I think that's, I mean, that comes back to what our core business has always been at EGR. We're an OE tier one manufacturer for the OEs. And that's where this product sort of developed. We developed it with Toyota for their Hilux, so the the, uh, the the number one selling, one of the top selling pickups in 
in Oz and we've developed it for their sort of top of the line, top spec vehicle. And so we've developed that along the line. So it makes it come part of your vehicle. So that's why the central locking connects, uses your, your factory key fob to open close. That's one of the best which things. Which is awesome, yeah. which I use all so, the time. So, yes. I mean, it's just, and you can actually use the internal buttons inside your, your cab, you unlock and lock. Yes. And do the same thing. So Correct. You can, when you want well, it's tied in with your CAN bus. Exactly. And, and, and I've said this before, it's been a few episodes, but the way you've integrated, you're not using a T-tap like a car stereo guy would no. do. You have factory, you have OE connectors. So you literally take two connectors, you put, put, your, you put the little, yep. you know, yeah. like a T in there, but it's the same as the factory connector. You click it back together. That's Nobody never going would, bad. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's just so This well goes back to you guys being t- tier one and being yeah. able to have that kind of engineering acumen into the product, which is what makes it special. Yeah, exactly. And look, I think it comes to what we're, our core business has always been. And look, sometimes we're a bit slow and sometimes we work, we understand, we over, over-engineer things at times. And that I'm not saying that for the aftermarket space, but overall, we want to deliver a product. You know, this comes from the same factory using all the same components that Toyota use on their factory vehicle as, mm-hmm. their, as their part. It's yeah. what GM do for theirs and other, other manufacturers. So There's no such thing as over-engineering. There's only yeah. under-engineering. Yes, true, true. true. And I, I think most, <laughs> most customers will wait for the better product, too. Mm. You know, I think there's a lot of, you know, here at CMA, there's the gold rush to have the first products on the new vehicle. Yes. But I think that that's, that's great for the splash. But it's not great for the customer. And I think there's a lot of people who, who weighed it out for the right product. Yeah. And look, I think for our product, we understand that, you know, there are, it's different to what's in the market currently, particularly the roll cover. It does take a little bit longer to install, but we know that once you've got it installed, you're not going to have the problems. Yeah. It's worth and you have to worry it about done it again. properly. So it's, as I said, it comes part of the vehicle and that's what something that we sort of get. And it is challenging and changing that mindset of compared to some of the other covers on the market. It is a longer install. We get that. But once you get it installed, once you do it a few times, you get used to, you will you will bring it down. And we got guys and I was doing it. Yeah, but look, I installed times. it. I, this guy right here yeah. the, with the two thumbs pointing himself. Like th- I did it. If I can do it, I'm telling you that anyone can do it. He has a hard time yeah, putting on a light switch. So no, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, look, I'm handy. I've got all the, the right tools, but I was intimidated. I opened the boxes and I said, I'm going to do it. It was you just called me crying. Like, no, yeah. That's not well, true at all. Could, he, maybe. That's he not was true. in the corner of his one uh, car garage, uh, just in the fetal position, sobbing. And if I you had go to truckshowpodcast.com and you go down the featured vehicles page, so Holman's 392, my TRX, and you scroll down, you'll see the installation video that I yeah. shot of the roll track, and it's straightforward, and I, again, anyone can do it. So if you have any uh, trepidation, watch my video, and you go, oh, oh, okay, I can totally do and this. And while you're there, garage. truckshowpodcast.com, go to our featured products page where we have the uh, our EGR section, and you can get a discount off of the product if exactly. you buy it. So uh, make sure you guys uh, get a rebate. Are, and I heard, I heard that our code's been working, so I like yes, that. Very good. So I appreciate all of our listeners yeah, who have nice. supported EGR, and of course, we uh, appreciate you guys for supporting the, no, uh, thank the podcast. You for your support. Look, it's great, and it's great to get the, the word out there. And as we said, we appreciate everyone supporting EGR, and we enjoy being back here in SEMA. It's nice being out, back here in the U.S. So it's uh, it's been a fun time. Well, we love the brand, and uh, I think it's time to uh, drink beers with you. Yes, let's do it. All right, so uh, how was that for our uh, our second EGR in booth uh, episode? I'm impressed by us. No, I I was worried about this uh, pretty much all week long, mm-hmm. uh, stressed about it, and then I realized in the middle of it, I'm like, oh yeah, we're pretty good at this. I think. I mean, you are. <laughs> I mean, we're not horrible. <laughs> so, I mean, before we started this, uh, before we even started rolling the recorder. Holman rolls up and he goes, mm, yeah, you don't look good. And I'm not no, feeling you, good. No, you you hung through there. I was proud of you. Good job. I, so if you're listening and you're like, hey, Lightning's not saying as much as he normally does. Oh, no, no, that it, wasn't an issue. Oh, no? No, no, <laughs> you'll, you'll listen back to it. It'll be, I, I, I'll, let, I'll you. I let you all lead good. most of these, A, because uh-huh. you're a little more qualified in some of these areas. But I just, man, I am just beat. I have got something going on with my left leg and my right hip. I'm just like falling it's apart. It's age. But it, no, I don't think so. Uh-huh. Maybe. Maybe it is. But regardless. Did you call my guy who does the neck cracking? Uh, no, I went to another guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. but Did I, it help? I, dude, I've had everything. I, I've, <laughs> I've been stretched. There's a dude that comes to my house now and wow. stretches me all weird and wacky Ooh. like a pretzel. And, and it hasn't helped? And he's like, yeah, I've seen worse. And I go, oh, oh really? That, that's not that's so not a great qualifier. It, it, it's, it's weird. I, I, enough talking about my health. It, I'm fine overall, but I'm just freaking <laughs> tired and I'm worn. So, but I'm, I'm excited. You know what's keeping be, us from ending the show? Me. You. We have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop right now. So we need to thank Nissan for making this yes. show possible. Yep. Uh, are we going to go see Nissan tomorrow and uh, then yeah. try to weave this in or what? We well, doing? I think we're going to have a couple SEMA episodes 
I don't know how what the frequency will be, but we've got a lot of interviews. We've been covering a lot of ground here. Okay. So uh, this is our this is our first drop. There'll be more SEMA drops this week, and uh, we appreciate you guys listening. We appreciate Nissan for being our presenting sponsor. Of course, we super appreciate our friends over at EGR for having us in their booth and uh, for the free beer. And so that's uh, oh, that's awesome. Which, I'm uh, you should probably drink that. Like and then of course, right uh, AMS oil. And uh, base. Mm. So we got everybody here. We're gonna do. Uh, How many uh, rear uh, Ram Air rear diff covers did you see? A few. Uh, there are a few I, here. I've seen at least seven so yeah. far. No. Yeah. There are quite a bit. And uh, I went through the Amsoil booth today, and we're gonna go uh, grab a bite with them. So man, okay. it's just been a great see so oh, far. Are we hanging out with uh, Mr. Birdsall? If we he shows are up. gonna go see Mr. Birdsall. So what I want to do is right when he takes his first bite, we should stick a recorder right in his face and interview him. Because he's a food snob. He is a food snob. So that, like, I want to ruin that experience for him. Amsoil at first asks us like, hey, what, "What do you guys want to eat?" And then the, and then Holly at Amsoil yeah. she says, "Dot dot dot." Wait a minute. Scott's the food uh, snob. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks, everybody. And don't forget, head to truckshowpodcast.com if you're interested in finding out more about uh, the EGR products. Uh, you can see the link on our uh, page under featured products and also our affiliate code or our rebate code. So make sure you use that and uh, buy yourself some EGR products. I think we're officially the last people in the West Hall. Good night, Steve. The Truck Show. The Truck Show. The Truck Show. Oh, oh.